Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in the home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Our God is God's salvation. And to God the Lord belong deliverances from death. Amen. Please remain standing for our first hymn. And that first hymn is num and that first hymn is number seven hundred and nineteen. To the repentant of heart in Christ Jesus, there is sure forgiveness. We're reminded of that truth from Romans the 8th chapter. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, in Christ Jesus there is sure forgiveness of all our sins. Be at peace. Amen.
Today's scripture comes from Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 11, and that's on page 965 of the Blue Pew Bible in front of you. This is God's word. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or, which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or, if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would attend to this word, your spirit, and that you would work through your word to remind us of what we already know, inform us of what we do not know, accept what we do not want to believe. Lord, that we would, as uh, children, simply listen and take the word of their parents as truth, that we would have the faith of a little child and trust you, our Father, to tell us the truth, what is helpful and what is good for us to know. And Lord, I pray that we would pray, and that we would pray not because it is a duty, but that it would well up inside of us as, uh, as our desire to communicate with our Heavenly Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. So we're on uh, chapter 7, the third chapter of the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus addressed this sermon to people who are already disciples. And so the sermon is not how you get into the kingdom. It is how people who already are in the kingdom, people who already are Christians, are to behave. Jesus began with our own self, our own character, and he gave the the beautiful attitudes of a Christian. And then, if you are, if you do have a Christian character and do have those beautiful attitudes, then that's going to affect how you are in the world. And those beautiful attitudes manifest themselves outside of you in the world as salt and as light. And you are also a worshiper of God. And so Jesus addresses three realms of worship, the way, we, the way we give our money, the way we pray, and the way we discipline our own body. He uses, he uses fasting, but I think he's talking about even more than fasting. And so we see that we are to have a Christian character in ourselves, a Christian influence in the world, and a real piety, a real genuine piety before the Lord, not a showiness for other people, but a piety before the Lord. And Pastor Mike had some terrible news for us last Sunday. You know what happens if we achieve that, those beautiful attitudes, that Christian influence, and a genuine piety before the Lord? We just get a little bit judgy. (laughs) We feel pretty good about the fact that we've attained to those things. And so we look down our snouts at other people, at those less good Christians, or God forbid, those non-Christians. We look down at those people, and we are judgmental toward them. And that's what's been going on in the Sermon on the Mount. And that is the only context that we can understand Jesus' words this morning. To seek, and to ask, and to knock. And when we seek and ask and knock, we'll be answered and given. And only in those contexts can we understand the words of Jesus. Why do I bring this up? Because we are in the middle of a country that is in, uh, in absolute love with prosperity gospel preachers in your own town, and prosperity gospels more pronounced 
on the television set. And one of the favorite verses to use as a prosperity gospel preacher is Matthew 7, 7, and Matthew 7, 8. And when you wrench these verses out of the context of what we're talking about, Christian character, Christian influence, Christian worship, when you take that context away, when you take out a pair of scissors and cut out two verses of the Bible, and then you talk and you talk and you talk and you give your own opinion, then, and only then, can you now utilize Matthew 7, 7, and Matthew 7, 8 to make it seem as though Jesus is preaching a prosperity gospel. And a prosperity gospel is this. God wants you to be healthy and happy and wealthy. Here's what's amazing about that. Those are, <laughs> you're never going to believe this. That's what I want for myself. <laughs> I want to be healthy too. This is amazing. I never seem to have enough money for all the vacations that I can dream up. And sure, nothing's hurting me now. I could go for some more health. Throw it on, God. And so, the prosperity gospel appeals to our most base nature and desire. And it is, ends up being, okay, everyone get ready to roll your eyes and say, there's Pastor Pete with his exaggerating again. There's Pastor Pete with his hyperbole again. He doesn't think that the word of God is enough, so he's got to go add uh, all these exclamation points and shout and stuff. Go ahead, you're about to think that. I don't care. Because the next thing out of my mouth, I'm absolutely convinced is true. The prosperity gospel is satanic. The prosperity gospel is satanic. The prosperity gospel is satanic because what is Satan? He's crafty. And his first move is always this. To take the word of God, to quote the word of God, and to cleverly and craftily distort the word of God in such a way that it seems like he's actually giving the word of God and simultaneously is what I would want to to have happen or to be true anyway. So it is a misrepresentation, a taken out of context of the word of God and it just so happens to be what you would want to be true. And then and only then, when he's got you, when he's got the hook in your mouth, then and only then does Satan amp up the boldness and just outright contradict God. And so the prosperity gospel is satanic because it is using the good news, the promises of God, to lie to people, to lie to people who think that they're Christians and they're not, or to lie to people who are Christians and they are being misled by wolves who don't dress like wolves. But instead, for Halloween, they just wear their Halloween costume all 52 weeks a year. They choose a sheep costume because sheep are approachable and a sheep would never bite and devour your soul. And so, here's what I've said so far. Matthew 7, 7 and 8 does not mean what prosperity gospels say it means, which is this. Name it and claim it. Tell God your your deepest uh, desires, your financial uh, ambitions. And by the way, don't be shabby. Don't be stingy. Don't you know who God is? You have an inheritance in heaven. It is because you remember those. uh, 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 I was sick for a couple days, and I watched TV one of those mornings. And every single commercial break, the Fonz was telling me about reverse mortgages. Every for six straight hours, the Fonzie was telling me about reverse mortgages. And basically, I think that the idea was this. You already have this. Now start to borrow against this. And the, the, the false gospel, I listened to two sermons from false teachers from wolves in sheep's clothing this week. And they both said something like this. You've got an inheritance in heaven. Now start to borrow against it here on earth. Oh, it's not working? Try harder. Oh, it's not working? Send me more money. And seek and knock and ask and it will be given to you. What's wrong with you? Aren't you seeking and knocking and asking? And, and 
the reason you don't have health and wealth and happiness. That's your problem. You're not asking hard enough, you're not seeking hard enough, and you're not knocking hard enough. If you're sick, if you have a disease, if you have financial troubles, or if you're dismayed or downcast, those are all on you. Because you're not trying hard enough. And that is, as the Apostle Paul says in the book of Galatians, that is no good news, which is what the gospel means. Their good news is no good news. It is satanic. It has the feeling of something that would be good, health, wealth, prosperity. It has the feeling of something that would be good, but ends up in a hell of, a, a hell of, of our own making, a hell on earth. Worst case scenario, a hell not on earth as well. In my humble opinion, you cannot get a prosperity gospel from Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Instead, Jesus is talking about what he's been talking about in Matthew 5 and 6, which is Christian character, Christian influence, and Christian worship. If at any time in the past couple of months, I don't know how long we've been doing this, it's all, a, it's all a blur to me. It feels like we've been talking about this for months, though. But if any time, Pastor Mike or I have talked about a beautiful attitude, and then you thought to yourself, oh, shoot, that's not, like what, that's not what I'm like at all. I'm not even a little bit like that. Or if any time someone was talking about being salt to our culture and being a light to our culture, and any of you, with any humility, said, I am neither salt nor I am more darkness and, and, uh, and decaying to, to our culture than I am salt and light. Or if anyone heard a sermon about genuine Christian giving and genuine Christian living and genuine Christian prayer, and you say, I pray for 30 seconds and I fall asleep. I give and I want everyone to applaud my giving and so on. If any of you felt that you didn't measure up at any point to any of these sermons, this is exactly what Jesus is talking about. So, Asking and seeking and knocking are not about material wealth or health or happiness. Asking, seeking, knocking are about Christian character, the fruit of the Spirit. And there's a promise. But before we get to the promise, think about it. Who is Jesus? Answer, he's the king of kings. He's your king. Now, if your boss at work, if your father at home, if your local county city authority tells you not to do something, if your president tells you not to do something, if any authority figure tells you not to do something, you are required to obey. And if they repeat that thing, then you are really required to obey. And if they say it three times, you should obey. And so, prayer is not an option. We must, repeat it three times, ask and seek and knock. And asking is easy because it's just words. And I can just talk to somebody that's already in a room with me and I can ask them for something. But sometimes the, the, the person I need help from isn't right in the room. And my bottom in a, sorry for my language, kids, and my bottom in a lazy boy, it won't do. So I have to get up and walk around and seek and look for help. And so regardless of how I feel, even if I don't feel like God's in the room and I can just speak to him, even I feel, if I feel like God is a distant God, you know what I have to do? I have to get up off of my bottom, off of my lazy boy, and I have to seek. And what if my feelings tell me that God is not only not in the room and God is not only hard to find, that God is distant and he shut a door between us? Jesus uses a present tense form of the Greek language that better translated in English would be this. Ask and keep on asking. 
seek and keep on ask, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. Be persistent in prayer. Get up. Knock on doors. Keep asking your father for what? Not health, wealth, and prosperity, but keep asking your father for the spiritual resources that you need to live your Christian life, to have the beautiful attitudes of Christian character, to be salt and light to our culture, and to genuinely worship our father in heaven. Seek and knock and ask and keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it, and then he attaches promises. You'll receive. You'll find. The door will be open to you. Oh, you didn't get it? He just repeats in verse 8 everything he says in verse 7. For anyone who asks, receives. For anyone who seeks, finds. For anyone who knocks, presence of God is given to him. So, here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying this. Oh, I know how you all, I know how you listen to a sermon. Talk about satanic lies. I know how we listen to a sermon. We sit in a church and we hear from the scripture. And if there's a faithful pastor administering the word of God, here is what we do. Often, we say, the thing he is saying is true for someone else. The thing he is saying is true for the real Christians. It is true, yes, I don't deny Christ. I don't deny the word of God. I'm just humble about it. I just know where I stand. I don't have my act together. I've never had my act together. And with these nice Christian people with their giant Bibles and their suits and ties and their Sunday best, if they knew what a wretch, if they really knew what went through my head, no, no, no. I'm just barely a Christian, if a Christian. And so all of those wonderful promises of the Bible, those do apply to real Christian people, but I'm not one of them. And that is not what Jesus says in verse 8. Anyone who is a Christian. Anyone who is a Christian, if they ask and they seek and they knock, they'll find the door will be open. Anyone. Now, the promises are not about health, wealth, prosperity. The promises are Christian character and conduct. But wait a second. It seems like, you guys can tell me from your own personal experience, seems like sometimes you pray for those and you even, in your, in your own mind, pray for those persistently. You keep on knocking and keep on asking, keep on seeking. And even those do not happen. You've been struggling with the same sins for decades. It seems like the promises of God are, are claimed in Scripture, but you still fail. You still are not the person that you want to be. So Jesus has two hypothetical situations for us, and they are these. Which of you? You got a kid. He's hungry. He asks for bread. And then you get an object that from a distance looks a whole lot like bread, but it's harmful and destructive and disgusting and inedible. Who would give a stone that looks like a loaf of bread to a child? Answer, hardly, almost nobody. Even a wicked father wouldn't do that. Remember, he's probably by the Sea of Galilee. There's eels. And he says, which of you, if you had a, a son who needed fish, who wanted to eat an eel and say, ha ha, I got a snake for you instead. None of you would do that. All human fathers are evil. Whoa. That's not a popular thing to say, Jesus. You want to you run that back, Jesus? And say all human fathers aren't as good as they could possibly be? Jesus says, no. I said what I said. Human fathers are evil. 
And what do they do? They give bread when their children are hungry. They give fish when their children are hungry. They're not tricksters. And they're not mean. Evil dads provide for their children. Therefore, therefore, you have a heavenly father who is infinitely better than the best dad in this room or the person who had the best dad in this room. God is your father. So he's like him in that he's good. Those of you who had great dads, those of you who are great dads, God is like you but infinitely better and would never trick you in not giving you something that you need. And then some of you will say to me, I had a horrible dad, I am a horrible dad, I was a horrible dad. And Jesus is contrasting. He's saying that God is an infinitely better father than you ever had, you ever were, that you ever are. And so if you think about how even poor dads provide for their kids by giving them what they need for the day and Our God is infinitely more powerful, infinitely better, infinitely more loving. Then the question is this, why are you not asking and seeking and knocking? Why are you not praying? You know the character of God. He's your father. He's better than any version of an earthly father that you could ever conceive of. You know yourself. You're a sinner. There's a tension that starts to pull. God is an infinitely good father. You, though you are evil, there's a tension here. And that's why we have whole gospels. That's why the gospel of Matthew is not merely the Sermon on the Mount. That's why of the four gospels, the second half of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are all the story of the Passion Week because none of the four gospel writers can wait to get to the main point of what they're writing. 50% of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is just the last week, the death, the, the, the events directly leading up to the crucifixion of our Savior. Why? Because the cross solves that tension of an infinitely good and loving Father And you, a putrid, failing father on your best day. And Jesus says, yeah, I know. That's what the cross is about. I bridged that gap. I already paid for that. I took care of it. Anyone. The promises that you'll get an answer, that you'll find that the door will be open to you, Those are true, verse 8, for everyone. Why? Because of the cross. Though God is an infinitely holy, infinitely beautiful Father, and though you are an evil Father, the cross pulls that tension together. And Jesus bids us come and ask our Father for what we need. Now, here's the, the rub That's underselling it. Here's the problem. Hearty amen to everything Pastor Mike prayed in his pastoral prayer. Of all the difficult seasons in our church, this has been a difficult season in our church. I know that by and large, We're not parroting, we're not, this isn't a bunch of people, we're not a bunch of Kenneth Copeland fans and that you're all praying for, for yachts. I think a yacht would be probably pretty inconvenient in the desert now that I think about it. I trust that 85 to 99% of everyone in this room remembers, takes down, to, to, it literally takes down or remembers what we pray for and ask and seeks and knocks and prays for the health and preservation and sparing of our dear sisters and brothers in Christ. In other words, I, I, had to, I had to address the prosperity gospel, yet I don't believe that that is something that, that most of us struggle with on a, on, on a daily basis. I do believe that we, that we as a church know how to pray, and I, be, I do believe that we do pray that we do ask and that we do seek and we do knock. And yet, 
here is what stretches our faith, not only to the max, but here's what stretches our faith, I think, to, to, to be more than we can handle at times. And it's, it's obvious. We think that we are asking for good things. And God gives us things that are simply unacceptable happen in our lives and happen in the life of our church. Unbearable grief and sadness the past few months in the, in the lives of some of our church. And yet, the way not to be a pastor, the way not to be a theologian, the way not to be a reader of the Bible is this, is to judge the truthfulness of these words from our Savior, from our Lord, from our King. The way not to do theology is to judge whether Jesus is right based on our human experiences. Objectively, seemingly, insensitive seemingly not 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 being able to read a room or a situation seemingly even perhaps borderline cruel is the truth of scripture which states this unequivocally from genesis to revelation god does give us ultimately good things in our experience, we live in a fallen world and things are absolutely horrible and horrific and unthinkable tragedies occur personally and as a nation and the world, obviously. And yet at the same time, Scripture resoundingly says that this is true, that God gives his children ultimately good things. Does that mean that everything that happens in your life is in itself a good? No, it does not. But the bad things, God is so sovereign and so providential and so wise that even the most horrific events in human history end up being used for God's ultimate glory and if you're in Christ, if you're part of God's kingdom, then whatever ends up for God's ultimate glory ends up actually being your good, even though it feels like a living hell and the exact opposite of good, and it feels terrible, and it feels that way because it is terrible. Exhibit A. It's right behind me. You stand with Mary. Mary. And you look at her only son being nailed to a tree. Her beautiful, innocent, the only good guy who ever lived. And you stand there with Mary. And she would say one thing to you. I'm confident I don't see anything good that could ever come out of this. He's the only, he's my boy. He's my innocent, beautiful son. And nothing good could ever come out of this. Jesus is perfect and he's being nailed to a tree. Given the information available to Mary on Good Friday, she is absolutely right. How could she be wrong? Her son is being put to death on a cross. The only innocent being treated as guilty. And yet... In God's plan of the ages, what was Mary staring at? The very best moment of human history, 1A and 1B with the resurrection. And so now, with those glasses, go and read every Old Testament event. Everything horrible in the history of Israel was leading to the next thing and leading to the next thing. And it was all unfolding for Jesus to be born. And so if we don't see that, we won't pray. And if we do pray, it will be dutiful. And it will be faithless. And we certainly won't be praying to a father. But if we do see that, if we could get in the mind of how we used to be, how we used to trust our dads, how we used to just feel safe and take the word of anything our dad said. Why? Because we knew the circumstances. No, we were, we were children. We couldn't read any circumstances. But we knew one thing. My dad is safe and he's mighty and he's telling me the truth and it's going to be okay because I'm with my father. And so our prayers should reflect that attitude toward our heavenly father. And yes, it stretches our faith beyond 
beyond what we are able to handle at times because we do ask and we do seek and we do knock. And it seems like God plays hide and seek and he double latches the door and he won't let us in. That's what it seems like. But by faith we know, by scripture we know. And if we've lived long enough in the Christian life, by personal experience we know that what is a, is a, is a living hell one day eventually works together for the glory of God. And if we are the children of God to our ultimate good, God is not a trickster. We do not pray in vain. He gives us bread and he gives us fish. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that that cross, objectively outside of our own feelings or personal circumstances, proved your love to us. If we were to look back as, uh, as Garth Brooks once sang and saw our lives, we would see some of the greatest gifts you ever gave us were unanswered prayers. The things we wanted most when we were 15, 20 years old would have absolutely destroyed our lives. And so, Lord, when we don't get the answers we're looking for, it's not that you're withholding good things. We only know that by faith and by hindsight, and yet we have to live forward. And so, Lord... I pray that when it seems that our prayers aren't answered, we would remember how true that is, remember your providential hand, and remember that the same hand guiding our life was nailed to a tree for our redemption. Trust you with our lives. Pray to you as our Father, and pray to you persistently as our Father, regardless of our feelings. Amen. Let's stand together and take our hymnals and turn to number 147.
keep you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you, give you peace, both now and forever and ever. Amen. Amen.